We are very creative. In fact, what has driven the world economy in the last 10 years has been us. We Asians, with the money. Without the money, you wouldn't have been able to do any advertising, no creativity, nothing. We're the end user. We have actually been entirely responsible for driving the innovation and creativity in the world in the last 20 years. And there are many things which you might not even know. And you talk about innovation um, having to grow through acquisition, Peter made a reference to. Three minutes later, Gilbert said his company has only been able to quadruple his turnover by three acquisitions in Asia. So the presumption somehow that we in Asia are lagging behind is simply not true. And if you were listening to the Chinese government 15 years ago, the last three plenum, they already admitted that it was important for China to develop research and development. And that's why there was the building of the science park in Haidian, just outside Beijing. And today, it's already too expensive to rent space there now because it's so successful. And that's all been driven by all the companies and institutions within China. And we seem to forget tens of thousands of very brilliant Chinese students coming back from Ivy League and Oxbridge and coming back to China to help it build itself in its technology and its sciences. I just think now there is no question that the rising middle class, especially in China, it's got 1.3 billion people, is going to be the engine of growth, of drive, both inside and outside. It took Deng Xiaoping exactly two years, three months, and four days after the death of Mao to introduce this enormous U-turn on um, making China into a, a sort of market economy. And it will go on um, for a long time yet. And we talked about, I think Lord Medicine talked about Shanghai. That will have far-reaching consequences. But mostly, I have to tell you, for the government officials and the rich people, because it is important for China to develop its room and be, without it being convertible, it would never be, in my mind, a world economy. And uh, it will become a, a huge laundry. I mean, Hong Kong is now the biggest Chinese laundry in the world at the moment. I mean, all the Chinese money goes right through, clean, and out it goes. I mean, in the last five years, I think $150 billion worth of IPOs uh, in Hong Kong. And I can assure you, not one room and has ever gone back to China. So people need to take their money out. Officials need to take their money out. Officials need ways of uh, paving the path to other people. So that will create corruption, bribery, and so forth. So you know, it's not perhaps as simple as one might think. And uh, Li ka only two days ago said that Shanghai is going to overtake Hong Kong. Well, he doesn't know. Because you know what? We have in Hong Kong something which is so much more precious than Shanghai, and that's called freedom. I mean, they're all the great patriots in China, all my friends in Hong Kong, they love China, they want to be members of this standing committee, that one sitting down, that one kneeling down, I don't know what, but none of them ever go and live in China. I said, if you love your country so much, why don't you go and live there? Oh no, I like Deepwater Bay, I like um, Stanley, and I like the peak. But as far as creativity is concerned, just think of the 250,000 students over the next five years that is going to return from the West to China, I think you will find that they are as innovative and brilliant and creative as anyone else. I always find it nauseating when people compare the East and the West. I find that there are so many more similarities between us 
than differences, except perhaps the Indians who always hide their money. Um, in <laughs> Geneva, there are about a trillion dollars of black money owned by Indians. 26,000 of you go to um, visit that city every week, and I've never seen an Indian on a ski slope. So they've just gone there to look at their money. That is a very difficult country. I don't understand it. So in terms of Asia, I don't know. That's the problem with India. But in terms of China, it's going to be a fascinating uh, place. But sooner or later, it's got to do one thing. It's got to connect with the people. The government cannot operate a huge and great nation without there being connection and without there being a soft reign of terror, which there is at the moment, between the government and the people. Forgetting about the ordinary fellow, nobody knows how decisions are made. All right, We've got wonderful institutions saying the government doing this and so forth. The seven members and the nine members of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, nobody knows. We had Mr. Bow coming very near to exposing it, but unfortunately, um, I don't think he will ever, uh, in my lifetime, uh, see it. So, so that's the problem. But going back to innovation and creativity, don't worry, we're, we're going to conquer the world. You talk about yellow peril, it's coming. Ladies and gentlemen, remember. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David.